Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Alexandria Center for Hellenistic Studies and the Institute for Mediterranean Studies Neoplatonic Lectures. Uh, we are very happy uh, that uh, Padelis Golitsis is uh, our uh, speaker today. Uh, Padelis uh, will uh, talk uh, on uh, Damascus' interpretation of the uh, sixth and eighth uh, hypothesis of uh, Plato's Parmenides. Uh, we all know uh, Pandelis, who uh, is uh, also a member of the team of the Between Athens and Alexandria project and a contributor to the volume uh, in honor of the 20th anniversary of the Bibliotheca Alexandrina. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I would like to say a few words about uh, his uh, work before uh, giving him the floor. Uh, Padelis is an associate professor of uh, ancient and uh, medieval philosophy uh, at the university, uh, at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, uh, where uh, he has been uh, teaching uh, uh, since uh, 2014. Um, at the same time, uh, he is also a, a, an associate member of the Aristotelismus Centrum of the Free University of Berlin and uh, of the Laboratoire d'études sur le monotheisme of the French uh, uh, CNRS. Uh, before, uh, before that, before coming to Thessaloniki or uh, at the same time, uh, he has uh, conducted research and or uh, taught uh, at several uh, universities and uh, research institutions, including the University of Munich, the University of Crete, uh, the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, uh, the Università degli Studi di Milano, Sapienza, La Sapienza di Roma, uh, the Center Leon Robin in Paris, uh, the Einstein Center, Crony of the Free University of Berlin, and of course, he has also been uh, an external collaborator of the research program Commentaria in Aristotle and Greca at Byzantina uh, of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. Um, he holds a first degree in classics from the University of Thessaloniki and uh, a diplôme d'études approfondies and a doctorat uh, from uh, the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Études in Paris and an habilitation from the University of Munich. Uh, his research focuses on Aristotle and the reception of Aristotle, uh, especially uh, late antique uh, Neoplatonic uh, commentators uh, on Aristotle, on Byzantine philosophy, uh, but also uh, Arabic philosophy, especially metaphysics, scholastic philosophy, and modern Greek philosophy with a focus on logic, and uh, of course, Greek paleography. Um, he's author of many books, book chapters, and articles. And I would just mention a few uh, of uh, the titles. Uh, Le commentaire de Simplicius uh, et des Amphilopon à la physique d'Aristote, Tradition et Innovation, uh, De Greuter 2008. And this book has uh, been uh, awarded the Zographos Prize of the French Association uh, for the Encouragement of Greek Studies in France. And more recently, he has published an edition, Modern Greek Translation and Commentary uh, of Aristotle's Metaphysic Lambda uh, by Crete University Press in 2021, an edition of Aristotle's On Progression of Animals, Cambridge University Press 2021, an edition of Alexander of Aphrodisias Commentary on Aristotle's Metaphysics Books 1 to 3, The Greuter 2022, and uh, last but not least, the Damascus Philosophy of Time, the Greuter 2023. So today's talk is also going to be on Damascus. Uh, Padeli, thank you very much. 
uh, for being here today. I don't know if you have a handout or if you would like to share screen. Thank you, Rini. Thank you very much for this very full introduction. I am delighted to be here with you. I have a handout which I will now uh, uh, share. And uh, I could also uh, share it on the screen. Would this be a good idea or? Uh... I think yes, if, if, you, if you think so. But um, let me see how this would. Yes, let me. How does this look like? Is it is it helpful or or? I think it is helpful. Uh... Okay, this is the same handout that uh, I have just uh, uh, sent. So my, I will be reading a paper here, which uh, I would like to uh, publish someday in some uh, form. So all uh, comments um, are uh, very um, welcome. It's about uh, Damascus' interpretation uh, of the objects of the sixth and eighth uh, hypothesis of um, the Parmenides. So I will start with a general uh, introduction. It is commonly assumed that Neoplatonism started with a theological interpretation of Plato's Parmenides. Theology in this context is concerned with all divinity, which according to the genuinely polytheistic Hellenic spirit and the Orthodox tradition, extended from the supreme God, or Uperano Theos, to put it with the words of Eudorus of Alexandria, later called merely Theos by Plutarch of Athens, down to the fallen, that is, embodied rational human souls. Many scholars believe that this eminent interpretation of the Parmenides started with Plotinus. Whereas previous Platonists interpreted the Parmenides chiefly as a playful dialogue, exemplifying the logical vigor of Plato's genius within a dialectical game against old Eleatics and contemporary Megarians, and this is actually mirrored in the in the subtitle of the dialogue, probably of Thrasinon uh, origin, Peridon e Logikos, Plotinus, these scholars claim, was the first to read the first three hypotheses discussed in the second part of the dialogue as respectively referring to the divine one, to the divine intellect, and to the divine soul. The title given by Porphyry to the first treatise of the fifth Ennead, and this is your T1, namely Periton Trion Archicon Hypostasion, reflects this state of affairs. In this treatise, Plotinus distinguishes between the one, the one many, and the one and many, and, and pola, and kai pola, and ascribes this distinction to the philosopher Parmenides of the namesake Platonic dialogue. Taking the lead from Plotinus, Subsequent Neoplatonists would read the Parmenides as a serious and rigorous philosophical exercise whose various hypotheses and deductions describe in a cryptic but masterful fashion not merely the gods, but all principles of the universe. If the above narrative is true, I wonder whether the so-called Neoplatonists should rather be called simply Plotinists. I must say, though, that this term was uh, reserved by Samuel uh, Taylor Coleridge uh, to the Cambridge Platonists of the mid 17th century, such as uh, Henry Moore and Ralph Cardwell. Now, following the Neoplatonists themselves, I sincerely doubt that Plotinus was the initiator of the theological, or if you prefer, archaeological interpretation of the Parmenides. Syrianus, for one, ascribes to the immediate disciples of Pythagoras knowledge of the transcendent one and of the first two intelligible gods, that is, the intelligible limit and the intelligible unlimitedness, and explicitly says, this is your text number two, 
the divine Plato, taking his start from these Pythagorean philosophers, utters the very same words in the letters, in the Republic, in the Philebus, and in the Parmenides. Now, in reality, these Pythagoreans were Alonymous authors who preceded Plotinus and whom we nowadays call or classify as Neo-Pythagoreans. Simplicius quotes Porphyry, who in his uh, treatise on matter, and this is text number three, quoted Moderatus of Gades, a Pythagorean philosopher of the first century AD, according to whom, I quote, T3, Plato, following the Pythagoreans, proclaims the first one above being and all essence, and he says that the second one, which is what really is and is intelligible, is the forms, and he says that the third, which is the psychic one, participates in the one and the forms, and that the last, the last nature after this, which is the nature of susceptible things, does not participate in them, but is ordered according to the reflection of the forms, whereas the matter that is in them, that is in the perceptible things, is a shadow of the not being which first exists in quantity and is even further below than that. End of quote. In all probability, these are references to the Parmenides, since Plato does not posit a sequence of ones contradistinguished to the others, and here in this quote, the others are perceptible things, in which the forms are reflected in any other dialogue. Of course, in the sophists there are mentions, but there is no there is no this kind of sequence of several ones which are contradistinguished to the others. I also doubt, despite a recent attempt, attempt at establishing the contrary, that Plotinus had a theory about the objects of all hypotheses of the Parmenides, be they eight, nine, or ten. This is not to deny that Plotinus must have thought that, in Plato's mind, the subsequent hypotheses of the Parmenides had, like the first three, particular natures as their objects. After all, Moderatus did not limit himself to the first three ones, but further posited the perceptible things and the matter, and Plotinus himself says, and this is text number four, the forms in the bodies are that is, the, that is the forms in matter, hmm? are many and are many in one, pola kai hen, and the bodies are merely many, pola, whereas the supreme is exclusively one. But this only shows that, like Moderatus, Plotinus had considered five hypostases as being the objects of certain hypotheses of the Parmenides. This is also suggested by the very title on the three Principial hypostasis of Enead 5.1. If the principial hypostasis, Archicae hypostases, were only three, then the three would be redundant. With this title, Porphyry probably meant to convey that although there are several, not only three, principial hypostases discussed in the Parmenides, Plotinus deals in Enead 5.1 only with the first three. It was actually left to Porphyry and to his peer Amelius to develop a full-blown theory of the objects of all hypotheses of the Parmenides. It is true that in his, in his Platonic theology, Proclus seems to begin the non-logical interpretation of the Parmenides with exegesis of Plotinus. Plotinus appears there as the oldest I quote, of those who roused their thought to Bacchic frenzy, anavakkeosan, with regard to Plato's doctrines, and is there compared to Proclus's master Syrianus for his theological interpretation of the Parmenides, although he is later criticized by Proclus as the initiator of a superficial interpretation of the second hypothesis, one which did not recognize the plurality of the divine orders that are there described. The fact is that the logical interpretation of the Parmenides was not eliminated by Plotinus, but by Plotinus's disciples. For Plotinus himself did not have a realist interpretation about all hypotheses of the Parmenides. Therefore, a skeptic Platonist could still argue that the Parmenides is at least in part, 
a dialectical game and ask if some hypotheses do not have a particular nature as their object, why should the rest of them have? When in his commentary on the Parmenides, Proclus construes the history of the correct, that is the non-logical interpretation of the dialogue, he actually passes over Plotinus and starts his history with Amelius and Porphyry. Evidently, this was because Amelius and Porphyry were the first exegetes who proposed a complete interpretation of the second part of the dialogue. And you can see this in, in this table, which I have labeled T5. The one, the intellect, the rational souls, the irrational souls, matter insofar as it has suitability to participate in the forms, that is quantified matter, matter as actually having forms, that is ordered or qualified matter, matter as deprived of forms, that is prime or pure matter, and the forms in matter were the respective objects of the eight hypotheses of the Parmenides, according to Amelius. The first god, the intelligibles, Tonoeton Platos, also ordered body, that is qualified matter, unordered body, that is unqualified matter, ordered, that is quantified matter, unordered, that is prime matter, real forms in matter and forms in matter as they exist in human thought, that is post-rem universals, were the respective objects of the nine hypotheses of the Parmenides according to Porphyry. I venture to say, therefore, that in the Platonic theology, the theological interpretation of the Parmenides starts with exegesis of Plotinus, not because moderators did not have any such interpretation, as some scholars have argued in the past and still argue today, nor because Proclus was unaware of moderatus's interpretation, but because moderators, unlike Plotinus, did not substantially develop his reading of the Parmenides, and what is more, because he did not leave an immediate legacy. Proclus commonly criticizes Amelius and Porphyry, as well as Iamblichus, who you can see this in the, in the third column, who also posited the real, although partly different, objects for all hypotheses of the Parmenides, among other things, the heavenly body and the sublunary body were now uh, were introduced by, Am by Iamblichus as the respective objects of the eighth and ninth hypotheses. So Proclus criticized all these three exegetes for the failure to grasp the real function of the last four hypotheses of the Parmenides. And I will now read the translation of T6. There is an error common to all these exegetes, namely that they did not understand that the first five hypotheses lead to, to true conclusions, whereas the last four demonstrate absurdities. Indeed, this was the purpose of Parmenides, and this N, uh, this was the purpose of Parmenides, um, this N here. I think that uh, this refers directly to N to to Parmenidi Prokemenon. Concetta Luna thinks that this is a reference back to Book 5, which I think is quite remote from here. But this, I think that this that this refers, and this is interesting because it is, an, I would say, an uh, unnoticed uh, testimony. This refers to uh, to the poem, to the philosopher Parmenides. This was the purpose of Parmenides the philosopher in his poem, to show how, if the one exists, all beings are generated from it. And how, if the one does not exist, all beings disappear and nothing will exist in any way. And this is what his whole method intended to show, that is the method he used in, in, in his poem, because uh, we know that uh, Proclus had a, had a manuscript of uh, Parmenides' poem, and which was later used by Simplicius as well. And so this, this is what his whole method intended to show, both through the establishment of the truth, truths, and this is the Aletheia part of the poem, or so I think, and through the refutation of the falsities, and this is the Doxa part of the poem. We should critically observe that here too, that is in the dialogue, Parmenides, the purpose of the persona Parmenides is to show that through the fact that the one exists, all beings 
receive their existence. Whereas, the whereas through the fact that the one does not exist, the whole nature of real things is radically annihilated. This is what Parmenides explicitly says in the conclusion of all the hypotheses. And having understood this point, we should not introduce at any cost other things as objects of the last four hypotheses, nor, so to speak, progress in a straight line, but we should consider the principles of beings through the first five hypotheses, whereas we should not look for particular natures through the last four, but show by, ref by refutation that if the one is annihilated, we are led to many impossible conclusions in respect of things which would seem possible to us. So this is criticism of the previous tradition. That is the tradition that precedes Theodore of Asini, or the philosopher of Rhodes. Proclus believes that the Parmenides is about the principles of beings, which is the same as to say about the divine henads. These are the ones posited in the first five hypotheses of the dialogue, a hen estin, hen a estin, so as to yield various either negative or affirmative conclusions for the henads with regard to themselves and the many things, and these many things are the others, ta'ala, in the first three hypotheses, and negative or affirmative conclusions for the other things with regard to themselves and to the henads in the fourth and fifth hypothesis. Recall, and you can see this in the in T7a, that the first five hypotheses of the Parmenides develop as follows. If the one is one, a n estin, which is different from the n a estin, which is a different formula, uh, different uh, 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 formulation in 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 uh, the second hypothesis. So, if the one is one, it takes negative predicates with regard to itself and to the things that are other than it. Two second hypothesis: if the one is, it takes affirmative predicates with regard to itself and to the things that are other than it. Third hypothesis: if the one is, it takes both affirmative and negative predicates with regard to itself and to the things that are other than it. Fourth hypothesis: if the one is. The things that are other than it take affirmative predicates with regard to themselves and to the one. Five, if the one is, the things that are other than it take negative predicates with regard to themselves and to the one. Considering that any being is because of its oneness, Proclus thinks that the negation of the one that takes place in the subsequent four hypotheses, and there we have the expressions a hen me estin, hen, hen a me estin, cannot point to real objects. Now recall that the last four hypotheses develop as follows, T7b. If the one is not one, it takes affirmative predicates with regard to itself and to the things that are other than it. Seventh hypothesis. If the one is not, it takes negative predicates with regard to itself and to the things that are other than it. If the one is not, the things that are other than it take affirmative predicates with regard to themselves and to the one that is not. A ninth hypothesis, if the one is not, the other things take negative predicates with regard to themselves and to the one that is not. According to Proclus, this section is an Ellenhaus that purports to show that if the one is denied, everything that has been shown about the Hennads and the things other than the henads from the second through the fifth hypothesis is also denied. This is taken to be a reductio ad absurdum obtained through the self-evident truth of what is contradictory to the affirmative and negative conclusions brought about from the sixth through the ninth hypothesis. Thus, whereas the second hypothesis establishes through its affirmative conclusions the existence of the various orders of the divine intellect, the sixth hypothesis shows through its affirmative conclusions that if the one does not exist, there are only perception and perceptible things, which is absurd. Whereas the third hypothesis 
establishes through its affirmative and negative conclusions the existence of the various orders of rational souls, the seventh hypothesis, hypothesis shows through its negative conclusions that if the one does not exist, there is no perceptive, imaginative, or discursive power at all, which is absurd. Whereas the fourth hypothesis establishes through its affirmative conclusions the existence of the forms in matter, ta enula eide, the eighth hypothesis shows through its affirmative conclusions that if the one does not exist, the many perceptible things themselves are only shadows and dreams, which is absurd. Whereas the fifth hypothesis establishes through its negative conclusions the existence of matter, the ninth hypothesis shows through its negative conclusions that if the one does not exist, there are not even shadows, but absolutely nothing, which is absurd. Now, Proclus's overall conclusion regarding the, fact, the function of the last four hypotheses is straightforwardly denied by Damascus at the very end of his own commentary on the Parmenides, which, as is well known, critically engages with Proclus's respective commentary. And look at T8, quote of uh, Parmenides, then if we were to say in a word, if the one is not, nothing is, should we be right? And Damascus comments on that. This is not the conclusion of the last four hypotheses, as Proclus says, for they do not all conclude to the impossible, but only of the two, that is, of the, second, of the seventh and the ninth hypothesis, in which not being me on meant complete negation, for nothingness is the consequence of these two. There is in Damascus's commentary on the Parmenides a, subver a subversion of the interpretation of his Athenian predecessors, namely Syrianus and chiefly Proclus, a subversion which has passed rather unnoticed. I should here say that there is a hint at it at uh, Paul uh, Caligas's recent translation of the Parmenides in modern Greek. In his introduction, I mean, he mentions this uh, kind of... Uh, uh, difference between Damascus and uh, the preceding exegesis of, uh, of, of, the, of the last hypothesis of the Parmenides. Now, this is perhaps due to the fact that a crucial passage of Damascus's commentary has been misunderstood by its editors and translators. Now, introducing the object of the sixth hypothesis, Damascus asks, and this is T9 here, Τι ουν το προκαίμενον εστιν εις εξέτασιν, ουδέν γαρ χυπόλοιπον εις αιδοκεί, πο καί εστα αδύνατα περί έωσεν τους φιλοσόφους, which uh, Joseph Combes translates as Quel est donc l'objet proposé à l'examen? En effet, il ne reste rien, semble-t-il, semble-t-il, de ce qui a poussé les philosophes vers les impossibles where the proposition de, de here is redundant. Actually, the translation should be as follows. What is then the object to be examined? For it seems that nothing has remained, which is what pushed, so this explains what happened with the, the preceding philosophers, which is what pushed the philosophers, that is, Syrianus and Proclus, towards positing the impossibilities as objects of the last hypothesis. And not nothing remains of what pushed the philosophers towards the impossibilities. The argument of his predecessors, as Damascus construes it, was that given that there are no principal hypotheses other than the one, the intellect, the soul, the forms in matter, and the matter itself, which are the objects of the first five hypotheses, the rest of them cannot but serve as a reductio ad absurdum. Damascus points out, however, that the object of the sixth hypothesis, namely, what is not one, so the object of the sixth hypothesis, what is not one, in Greek, to hen me on, which uh, 
Combes translates as l'un qui n'est pas. So this would be acceptable to Proclus, but it would probably be uh, not acceptable to Damascus because Damascus understands this to en me on, to hen me on as not as the one that is not as Combes, not as the one that is not, but as what is not one. So this what is not one is posited by Parmenides as knowable, gnoston, this is here the text number 10, and this is an argument at used by Damascus. So it's posited as gnoston, knowable, and moreover takes a significant predicate, namely this heteron here, namely its difference from the things that are other than it. Thus, Parmenides cannot, the, per, the persona Parmenides, cannot but discuss a real object, an existing thing, periuphestotos dialegetai pragmatos, which is precisely not one in the sense of the true ones posited in the first five hypotheses, and these true ones are the one superior to being, the one concomitant to being, and the one inferior to being, but which is positively not the others either, because it takes this predicate here. It is heteron, heteron ton alum. So it is not the others either. Damascus tacitly nuances Proclus's negation of oneness in the sixth hypothesis. The annihilation of the one, he says, is not complete. Tin anaires into henos ukeinai pantele. And explains that what is not sorry that and explains that what is not one to hen me on is actually the whole composite so the object of the sixth hypothesis what is not one is the whole composite that is pan to syntheton this composite is the sublunary world in its entirety which is only as he says an imagined or apparent one, to phantazomenon hen. This one succeeds to the becoming one, and this is to gignomenon n. so we have to phantazomenon n, which succeeds to the becoming one, to gignomenon hen, which is discussed in the fourth hypothesis, once the latter, that is the gignomenon n, has been mixed with matter, which is discussed in the fifth hypothesis. Unlike the one of the fourth hypothesis, which is on uh n, that is being that is not one. So the, the one of the fourth hypothesis, the one posited in the fourth hypothesis, is on uh n, that is, is being that is not one, which means that it is gignomenon, and Unlike, so unlike this one, and unlike the one that is completely denied later in the seventh hypothesis, to hen me on of the sixth hypothesis, that is the sublunary world, is a true not one. Alethos me hen, a true not one. It is a unity of genuinely many things that come to be and perish. And I will now read the translation of T12. Why then do we not say that in the sixth hypothesis it is the whole composite which is the object of the discussion? I mean, I mean that which is composed of the others, the formal, uh, the formal others, ta eidetika ala, and the material others, ta hulika ala, which have already been mentioned in the fourth and the fifth hypothesis. So the object is what is composed of the others, that is the formal others and the material others, which have been already been, which have already been mentioned, so that the discourse is about the individual and composite things of the sublunary world. In fact, this is the race of beings that has been remained, and this answers the question asked in T9, Tito Ipo, Udenesti Hypoloipon. So this is the race of beings, to so Philon, 
on Onton that has been that has remained, and this is the phenomenal one, to phenomenon, and and what is not true and what is not one and me on os alithos and what is not one truly. Indeed, qua composite, on the one hand, it imitates the one through the mixture of the others, and on the other hand, it is not one. For the one refuses all duality and a fortiori all composition, and much more the composition of the two kinds, i.e. the formal and the material, others. Damascus thinks that the particular nature with which the sixth hypothesis in, is concerned is the perceptible sublunary world, which is what is not one truly, or to put it differently, which is what is one only phenomenally. The sublunary world is a compound made out of the formal others, la eudetica ala, which are the forms in matter discussed in the fourth hypothesis, and the material others, ta ulica ala, which correspond to the pure matter discussed in the fifth hypothesis. It seems, after all, that the Parmenides progresses in a straight line in spite of Proclus's claim to the contrary. In order to articulate this progression, Damascus distinguishes between different layers of forms that actualize different layers of potentiality in the sublunary world of coming to be. Now, as their name says, the forms in matter, ta enula eide, are in matter, but are not mixed, symbophilmena, are not mixed with matter. The hora, as Damascus explains here in T13, is not a part of them. A hora uden meros aftu, tu en hule eidus. A form in matter is a formal other which, like an intelligible form, in itself is an incomposite entity, a syntheton. This means, text number 14, that although it is not genuinely one, it is one, although a form in matter is not genuinely one, it is one by participation, hence, and methexe, that is, insofar as it is a reflection, emphasis, of a true one that shines elsewhere, a terothy and a lambomenon, that is, in the intelligible world. Now, whereas a formal other is the actual participation of a coming to be sublunary being in an intelligible form, the actual participation of a coming to be of a sublunary being that comes to be the actual participation in an intelligible form of a sublunary being that necessarily comes to be. So this is the formal other. The material others, which are discussed in the fifth hypothesis, are in pure potentiality, dynamé. In other words, they do not at all have any suitability for receiving a particular form as Amelius would have put it. Now, between these two extremes, that is, radical potentiality of pure matter and actual participation of a matter form compound in an intelligible form through a form in matter, there are two layers, which Damascus thinks are also accounted for in the Parmenides, in particular in the sixth hypothesis. Starting from below, and this is in uh, T17, T15, there is the potentiality. There is first the potentiality, starting from below, there is first the potentiality of receiving a particular form, which Damascus calls being in potentiality below. This is how I venture to translate to epita de dynamé. So we have a dynamé tout court, and then we have to epita de dynamé. And then there is 
the potentiality from within itself. To af auton dynamé, to af how to dynamé, which is the potentiality actualized by a particular form in matter. Unlike the potentiality from within itself, the lower layer of potentiality is not linked to the intelligible forms, but is linked to the divine hemads that come immediately after the one. So we have a sort of circle. So the, the higher layer of potentiality is linked to the intelligible forms. So, so the, the potentiality that is actualized by a particular form in matter, whereas there is a lower level, lower layer of potentiality, which is not pure potentiality, which is a pita de, a pita de potentiality, which uh, corresponds to, uh, which is linked to the divine hemats, where being does not uh, exist. So this lower layer, the pita de duname, is not the radical potentiality of pure matter. It is matter's irregular and disorderly mo motion, as the time use has it, kitokinumenon hmm? plemelos kayatactus, and uh, which Porphyry had erroneously identified as the object of the fifth hypothesis. Damascus explains, and this is in T16, that the intermediate and the higher level of potentiality are introduced in the sixth hypothesis together with the composite one. I quote, I translate, in the fourth hypothesis, the forms, and these are the forms in matter, Tainulaide, were considered only in their actuality, having the one by participation, but the incomposite one, which was also in being, and this was discussed in the second hypothesis. I mean, which was in being in accordance with the very essence of being and not from the point of view of coming to be, like the psychic one too, which we saw before. So this is the incomposite, the fourth, the, the, the a matter reform, uh, sorry, a form in matter has the one by participation and this one is the incomposite one. In the fifth hypothesis, the incomposite one, which is also, which was also mentioned, which is also the one in uh, second hypothesis and then in the third hypothesis. In the fifth hypothesis, Parmenides gave existence, upestesato, to the ineffable of matter, that is, to what is like the receptacle, the receptacle of being, of forms, and of prodrome, prodromoi, reflections, prodromoi emphasis. All these, i.e. the being, the forms, and the prodrome reflections, are introduced together with the composite one. For the composite one was like an emanation of the one that is. This is the reason for which we can see in it both the potentiality, which is a preliminary echo of the one that is, and this is the potentiality below, this potentiality, which is a preliminary echo of the one that is, is the pita de duname, and the being itself, i.e. the form, which everywhere coexists with the one and which here in the sublunary world is given existence sunifistatai together with the potentiality. And therefore, it comes to be like the one that is and a phenomenal one. And for this reason, it is what is not one, to hen me on, because it is phenomenal and is constituted of others and is one by analogy. With regard to the nature of these others, Parmenides, in the eighth hypothesis, will explicitly predicate of them the is. Keto estin os autos diaredeno Parmenides erei en te ogdoeton hypothesion. Again, the estin predicated of the many in the eighth hypothesis is significant. as the difference as the heteron, which we saw with regard to, in respect of the sixth hypothesis. 
Now, remember that unlike the seventh and the ninth hypotheses, which negate the one completely and draw negative conclusions, the sixth and the eighth hypotheses yield affirmative conclusions. But whereas the sixth hypothesis yields affirmative conclusions for the phenomenal one, i.e. the composite qua composite, the eighth hypothesis yields affirmative conclusions for the others, the Allah, that make up this composite by precisely being different from it. Damascus points out, and this is T17, that the object of the sixth hypothesis, namely the phenomenal one, has to be understood jointly with the object of the eighth hypothesis, namely the phenomenal others. Uto kaito phenomenon hen pros ta phenomena ala haper enteogdoe paradidotai. When he later clarifies the purpose of the eighth hypothesis, he explains, and this is T18, therefore, to the first question, i.e., what is the purpose of the eighth hypothesis, we will answer that in this hypothesis, the things that are other than what is not one are discussed, i.e., the things that are other than the one which we saw previously, that is, in the sixth hypothesis. As that one was, so will its others be. That was the composite one and the phenomenal one, so that the others will also be of this kind, namely composite and phenomenal. That they are also composite, he says it clearly, when he asserts that they have mass, onkon, and are extended forms, eide diastata. Only what is composite has a mass. For neither the matter nor the form itself, that is the, the form in matter, have mass. So what are the things that Parmenides introduces in the eighth hypothesis with the others? Well, they are the composite parts of the composite one. And to stay within the realm of speaking about principles, we will say that these others are the more particular elements such as the elements of the various peoples or states of which the, ra the regionally different living beings are composed and produced, and not only the living beings, but also the plants and the inanimate beings. If you like, let me put it in this way. The wholes are what is not one, whereas the particulars and the individuals, not those that currently exist, but those that come to be and perish perpetually, are the things that are other than what is not one. Indeed, the individuals, qua merely individuals, are a certain ultimate principle, for example, of me and you, and of every particular thing. And this is the common form of the individuals, end of quote. When Damascus says that we have to stay within the realm of speaking about principles. He means to satisfy a common assumption of the Neoplatonic exegesis of the Parmenides, namely that it is a dialogue about the principles, or if you prefer, about the principial hypostasis. This should also hold for the eighth hypothesis. Nonetheless, the common forms of the individuals, and the common forms are not the forms of matter, the common forms of the individuals, are extended forms, aided yastata, mixed with matter, which come to be and pass away together with individual matter form compounds. So these common forms come to be and pass away, and this is not true of the forms in matter. They are thus different from the incomposite forms in matter discussed in the fourth hypothesis, and unlike them, they are not a principle or an auxiliary cause, Sunaition CRT19, of the sublunary order. So the forms in matter are a Sunaition of the sublunary order, whereas the, the common forms cannot be such a cause. Still, Damascus explains that Qua individuals, they are 
principles of the individual compounds that perpetually belong to this order, to the sublunary order. Unlike the formal others and the material others discussed respectively in the fourth and the fifth hypothesis, the phenomenal others, we are the phenomenal others, the phenomenal others discussed in the eighth hypothesis are generated and perishable masses, objects of doxa and sense experience, see, you, see here, COT20, objects of doxa and sense experience like me and you. We, or rather our bodies, are born from the totality of the four elements and disappear into this totality again. In its capacity of being, and I quote here T21, in its capacity of being the one composite plenitude of the four elements, to ectuton hen pleroma syntheton, the one composite plenitude of the four elements, this totality, which is ultimately the what is not one, discussed in the sixth hypothesis, is a principle of the sublunary order. That is the four elements and the plenitude of the fur. Of the four elements of the four elements in their turn the composite individuals which perpetually recycle the composite plenitude of the four elements are each a certain ultimate principle are head this as hate insofar as they transmit to their offsprings accidental properties that are characteristic and thus principial of certain regions of the sublunary world. Unlike his predecessors, Damascus interprets the Parmenides as mapping not only the realm that transcends becoming, but also the realm of living beings, plants and minerals. Proclus, and I will finish with this last paragraph, Proclus ascribed the discovery of the real function of the negative hypothesis to Theodore of Assini, or for some scholars to the philosopher of Rhodes, who, although he, although he erred uh, as to the total number of the Parmenidian of the, of the, of the hypothesis, understood that they serve as a reductio ad absurdum. Proclus points out that it was Plutarch of Athens who finally succeeded in offering a correct theory of both the number and the objects of the Parmenidian hypothesis. Damascus, for his part, appeals to the great Iamblichus, Ton Megan Iamblichon in T22, in order to confirm his interpretation of the sixth hypothesis. And he brings in Plutarch, Caio Hieros Plutarchos, next to Iamblichus, the loyman Iamblichos, as a further authority confirming that the, percep the, the perceptible indiv individual things may be objects of certain hypotheses. As in many other cases, Damascus's interpretation of the negative hypothesis of the Parmenides is a revival of the exegesis of the Palaioi, which Proclus did not know to appreciate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Padeli, for this wonderful, masterful uh, talk. Uh, I think there must be many questions. You have raised many topics for discussion. So please uh, raise hand or use the chat box. Well, if there is no question for the moment, okay, I can. Uh, Harold, Harold, <laughs> yes. Sorry, I can't. I I can't leave no questions being asked. Uh, uh, I think that this is a very salutary talk because 
uh, it's always seemed to me that Damascius was really actually reading the um, the last four hypotheses much more closely <laughs> than perhaps uh, was the um, what was the norm. So I um, was very uh, very pleased to the the general tenor of the the talk. I occasionally wondered whether there are passages in Plotinus that allude to an interpretation of the eighth hypothesis, but I agree that it's very important that by and large Plotinus didn't try to enumerate things beyond his own favorite hypostases, if that's what he should call them. Um, the, uh, the, the My main disagreement with uh, Padelis would would be right at the beginning of it all, where, as far as I'm concerned, it's rather unlikely that what we've got in this um, fragment of uh, moderatus through porphyry and through simplicius, it's rather unlikely that we've just got the. I was expecting of, that. I was. <laughs> to, it's a, I I know that's not a big deal, but. But don't you think it's important that um, those early people like Amelius and Porphyry paid so much attention to matter in various of their of their um, um, interpretations? But uh, uh, and and that what Simplicius is doing is quoting is illustrating a certain theory of matter which he finds porphyry illustrating through moderatus so the whole fragment of moderatus that we've got is supposed to be revealing something about um uh, moderatus's theory of matter which of course in amelius uh, types of matter start coming immediately after types of soul <laughs> but <laughs> yes Yes, well, this is very, very complicated matter, and I was expecting, I mean, some, I mean that this kind of uh, doubt, which is welcome, of course. Uh, actually, I've written a paper on this passage, which has not been published yet. So I would, I will, I will send this to you, and then you can uh, tell me what you think. But yeah, generally, fine. I think that, um, uh, well, it's true that Porphyry, the Simplicius quotes Porphyry, and uh, Porphyry quotes Moderatus. It is a question, I mean, what actually Porphyry quotes from Moderatus and so on. But uh, it is, and it is a passage or, I mean, the, the, the theme is, is, is what was, what the, the doctrine of matter. So it is a bit curious that, well, all these ones are mentioned. I mean, one should, should, could skip them. So exactly. it seems that, and, and, but, the, but they are there. They are there. And uh, the idea is not about, I think it's not about what my moderators think, thought about matter, but the main point is that, well, Plato follows the Pythagoreans. And this is what Porphyry wanted to show by quoting Moderatus. And this is what Simplicius also wants to show, and this is why he was Moderatus. So anyway, this is a complicated matter, but uh, the thing, I mean, the thing is that Actually, the, I, I think that these the so-called neo-Pythagoreans are are extremely important, and uh, it all started, I think, with them, not with Plotinus. <laughs> so that, and this does not mean that uh, Plotinus mm. was was an extremely important thinker. I mean, this he, he doesn't have to be original to be to be important. Uh, no, 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 indeed. In fact, he could he could get um, he could get um, Platonic interpretation in the right perspective. I mean, he was interested in getting the philosophy right above all else. Right, right. And, and where he found Plato on side, that's great. Right, um, right. But uh, th those little issues of, of interpretation as he saw them were perhaps not so critical. Thanks very much, Pandelis. <laughs> and if you, if you, if you, I mean, a last comment on this, that if you look at T2, it's which is a text by by Syrianus. 
So there, I mean, he says something, because we're used to talk of the Neoplatonists where, I mean, but all, all these people, all these philosophers thought that Plato was a Pythagorean. So yeah. it was not, I mean, the thing was that Plato uh, wrote philosophy. And this is why he was extremely important. But in a sense, Pythagoras was more important than Plato. And of course, Orpheus was more important than Pythagoras and so on. But there he says that the divine Plato utters the very same words in the letters. So we know the three kings and so on. In the Republic, which is the, the one that translates being an essence. And then in the Philebus, which is the Paras and the Aperon. And in the Parmenides. Yeah. And there, I mean, he he he's, he he has in mind Syrianus, a particular pseudo Pythagorean text, a particular pseudo Pythagorean text which we do not have, where there was, I think, all this sequence of ones, and I take this as a hint at Moderatus or at someone else who would have exploited Parmenides, in in that sense. And this would be what actually Moderatus would record in his treatise, which is quoted by Porphyry. Yeah. So but this is my this is my the general scheme of my interpretation. Parmenides is is a link between Pythagoras and Plato. In fact. In, right. But for for these thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Altman. Yeah, so I'd like to follow up on that uh, little underlined passage in T18 that you emphasized about where Damascus says to stay within the realm of the principles. And my question is, what is the alternative? Let me put it this way, that I'm trying to sort out the relationship between the, 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 the logical reading of the Parmenides and uh, what 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 we're seeing in the fellows that you're talking about. And it seems to me that I had never thought of this before, but one of the advantages to Plotinus content, uh, kind of focusing only on the first three hypostases or hypotheses rather, is that he doesn't have to explain the connections between all of the others. He doesn't have to give a holistic account the way you did and the way Emilius and these other guys have to do. And I can't figure out if it's you as a modern person who is giving a highly rigorous analytic uh, analysis of what these Neoplatonists did or whether it's the Neoplatonists themselves. But it seems to me that as soon as they open up the discussion to the relationship between all of the hypotheses in the Parmenides, that by definition, they are going to use the vocabulary and the methods of the logical approach to the Parmenides that they are professing to reject. That's why I like this text, to stay within the realm of the principles. When does he depart from that? Like, like in, in other words, and I'd like you to defend the Neoplatonists from the following charge that I'll bring against them, is that when they have to account for the whole of the Parmenides and explain the, the connections between the various hypotheses, Connections which inevitably take on a logical, take on logical characteristics, even though they're trying to interpret them in a much more holistic, principle-based, you know, theology, is that doesn't it seem obvious for the same reason that, for example, the uh, the, 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 the 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 modern calculus logic by not having X and Y identified forces us to think more plainly about the actual logical I mean wasn't why wasn't it clear to them that 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 it, that they would necessarily err by putting the cart before the horse in other words that instead of unpacking the logical structure which their own determination to give an account of the whole dialogue somehow forced them to do that what they're really doing is exercising their little ingenuities to put in various metaphysical, ontological, physical, cosmological X's and Y's, which could only queer the pitch in the sense of getting clear on what is actually going on in the relationship between the various hypotheses. In other words, that they net that they, 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 they cannot but stay within the realm of the principles because they don't know how not to stay within the realm of the principles. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is, um, um, of course, this is uh, hard to answer, but uh, the let me let me put it this way. Um, I mean, the logical interpretation of the of the of the Parmenides was the common thing to say. I mean, before the Neoplatonists, and as I would say, before the the Neo Pythagoreans, and I think that this is this changed when people like I mean, all these pseudo disciples of Pythagoras, these Neo Pythagoreans, started to be interested in the so-called unwritten doctrines of Plato and to try to create a link between these unwritten doctrines of Plato with the Pythagorean teaching. And um, so there, and this is really important, and uh, I had a discussion with Paul Kaligas recently about that, that this is due to Aristotle in a sense, because when we have all these testimonies through Aristotle about the unwritten doctrines of Plato. So there you have the one and the indefinite diet. So I take it that, well, a, a, a neo-Pythagorean like, like Moderatus would start to look in the Platonic corpus about things or statements or doctrines concerning the one. And the Parmenides is the most evident place to look for. And this is what started the the, the so-called theological, or if you prefer, realistic interpretation of the Parmenides. And then they say, well, that, well, okay, we have these one, three, four, five hypotheses. I mean, Moderatus seems to have uh, opted or to have determined five objects, five particular, five natures, so to speak, or five hypotheses. But I think that this was a problem for all those peoples that were standing for a realist interpretation of the Parmenides. Because if you want to... Uh, to argue for such an interpretation, you need to find objects for all hypotheses. Otherwise, I mean, it doesn't work. Otherwise, it seems that, well, a part of it is a dialectical game, a logical exercise, another part is not, and this destroys the whole argument. So this is, I think, that Plotinus had in mind, uh, was thinking along, along those lines, but it was his disciples who... Uh, that is Amelius and Porphyry, who first proposed this full-blown theory. So nine, eight or nine objects, I mean, of the eight or eight, nine hypotheses of the Parmenides. And there, I mean, they had to, and then they had, to, of course, to not to, how to say, to posit objects in an uh, arbitrary way. But from the very beginning, there was this idea, well, that all hypostasis, or this idea that all hypotheses should have to do with principles. And this is when the principle comes in. And this then becomes in Proclus an argument to reject certain suggestions. Because if you have a, like Porphyry for instance, says that the object of the ninth hypothesis are post-rem universals. And Proclus would say this is wrong because the post-rem universal is not uh, a principle or qualified matter, or unqualified matter. So it seems that previous thinkers, and this is what actually Damascus' uh, attempt was. So previous thinkers looked for particular nature, so to speak, for all nine hypotheses. Then Plutarch of Athens said, well, that we should not do that in a way, and this is what we find there later in Proclus and, the, and in Syrianus and Proclus. But Damascus, would revive the previous interpretation and would say, well, that there are seven principles that are discussed in the Parmenides. So you do not have real objects in the uh, seventh and in the ninth hypothesis. This is his interpretation. Perhaps, I mean, then Proclus, if he was aware of it, could argue in a, against it, but... Uh, that was the end of the of the Parmenidian exegesis in 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 uh, in antiquity and in antiquity, but the principal th thing is an argument to reject particular certain suggestions. So when you are when you opt for a realist interpretation of the Parmenides, you should posit principles for uh, all hypotheses of the Parmenides, and this is really interesting because 
this is a uh, for, for but Damascus uh, how turns the whole dialogue into a into a map of 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 the entire universe. So this, I mean, in the eighth hypothesis, when he introduces these particular elements, so it's in a sense a kind of anthropology or 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 phytology or mineralogy or things like that. So and he he sees that the there are particular characteristics in different regions of the universe, and this would be somehow has to be accounted for in the in the in the Parmenides. So this would be my my longer comment rather than uh, answer to your question. But thank you. Thank you. Well, any any other questions or comments? Well, if I might just follow up, just to, to, yes. to that 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 I guess what I'm what I'm trying to drive at is that this movement that you're talking about that is going to climax with this well that wonderful way you described it at the end where it's the whole universe uh is that 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 it also means the reinstatement of the logical reading of the parmenides but not skillfully done what i mean by that is that when you decide to interpret the whole dialogue and to account for everything that Plato says in it, because the actual uh, interstices and tissue of the actual dialogue do involve a lot of logical terms and a lot of logical concepts in which, well, I mean, and then modern ideas like reductio, reductio ad absurdum, which maybe isn't mentioned in the dialogue, but which becomes useful for interpreters of it, is that they're forced to reinstate the 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 predicate calculus of a logical reading, but they don't do it well because they've got this, they've got this protological imperative to find metaphysical ontological principles behind everything, which it would seem to me would automatically make it difficult for them to really read the dialogue. That they would have that that, uh, that yes. instead of Yes, I, I see I see, but I mean perhaps well this 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 may be true. But you know, I mean, there is, there are contra contradictory statements, right? In every 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 conclusion, so you have they have to make sense and the, the, of it. And the idea, of course, because they introduce, which is there is the there is this uh, uh, this this idea of uh, the consequences for the one with regard to itself and to the other things. So pros. Heauto and pros ala. And this is through this device, so to speak. So it's not that I mean in modern in modern interpretations of the Parmenides, in contemporary interpretation of the Parmenides, uh the pros pros hauto and pros ala distinction is not simultaneously used within a single hypothesis. They are so you have consequences for the one with regard to itself, and then you you move on. But in the Neoplatonist interpretation, in each single hypothesis, the consequences are examined in respect of the themselves, the one and the other things. So this proserton prosala device is used within each one uh, hypothesis, and this is a device which is quite clearly. This is extremely important for them because they want to distinguish the henads, which are posited in the antecedent. So this one, n a estin, n a estin, n a n estin, etc. This is a henad, and then you get the conclusion, which are uh, the other things that may be, for instance, the divine orders or uh, the intelligible forms or whatever, or rational souls or whatever. And I, I do not see how this could be supported from uh, from the point of view of uh, of logic. That is this idea that well, you have that this pros heauto and pros ala distinction should be applied within its one single hypothesis. 
A perfect answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. That 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 works, right? Because they're looking at them atomically almost. It's like each one is, and that for us it might be obvious that this run through prosala pros that like that that's crucial to what Plato's doing. They don't feel obligated to do that, and so they're not really reinstating the logical reading because they're because they're kind of practicing a hermeneutic isolationism on each hypothesis. Right. That's what you're saying. Right. 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 Thank you. Right, thank that's you. very helpful. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. So, uh, if there is no other question for the there moment, is, there is Carlos. There is. Oh, there is Carlos. Oh, oh I, I'm sorry. There. I I didn't I didn't see a hand or. Yes, Professor Steele, please. I'm sorry. Okay, I at the end I would like to defend progress interpretation and um, the mask is not really a progress. And my you so always my, say that no 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 I will give my argument and the argument is linked to what uh, William Altman said about well somehow you have to respect the logical structure the dialectical structure of the text and I think what's uh, remarkable in progress is that he keeps the basic structure of the dialectics we start with hypothesis taking the one is what follows and denying the hypothesis or taking away the hypothesis what follows and then you can of course uh, I, I mean uh, you can then discuss about the first four or five depending on how you read it uh, but, but it makes no sense to to try to find other principles in the last four so it's i think damascus is really destroying the main logical structure of the debate whereas proclus as very careful in keeping the deck, you can uh, uh, reject his uh, realistic or theological interpretation, but for the structure, I think he remains wonderful close to the text. No, I, I agree. I agree totally with what you said. <laughs> But the thing is, no, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to defend. I mean, uh, Damascus's interpretation of the Parmenides, but I think that his interpretation of the, of the Parmenides is extremely interesting, and I think that there is a different purpose that they, I mean, Proclus and Damascus serve in a way. That is that they, or Damascus's purpose, purpose, so to speak, is 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 quite different from uh, Proclus's, and he tries to read the Parmenides. As how to say, I mean, as I said, as 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 offering a uni a, a universal mapping of the entire existence, which is not the case with the uh, interpretation of I mean, with Syrianus's and Proclus's and Plutarch's interpretation, what you get from the Parmenides is a mapping, a description, if in a cryptic but masterful fashion, of the realm that transcends becoming. So you 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 have matter, which is which is the, the 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 foundation of becoming, if you like. You have forms in matter that uh, are the participations of of the matter form compounds, and that's all. And then you have all that is above. So Damascus takes all this. He says this is right, but he further says that well, there are further layers that the Parmenides offers also a full description of the realm of becoming. And this is extremely important and I think that it relates to his own preference and interest in Aristotle's philosophy. And this is what he brings in in this. So this, I mean, for instance, these several layers of potentiality, which I briefly presented, all this comes from Aristotle or, uh, well, Aristotle from Plato read together with Aristotle. And uh, 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 his interest in Aristotle's physics, and we know well his interest in paradoxography and in geography and all these things. And this is, I think, what he somehow, uh, what somehow uh, uh, influenced his his own his uh, his uh, approach of of the Parmenides. So he wanted to read the Parmenides as describing the entire existing real. And he found some support for the, for such a reading in the what in, in the in the in the Paleioi exegetai, that is 
uh, the exegeti, the, the commentators uh, who preceded Theodore of, uh, of Asino. Th that was his project, I think. So a full-blown theory within the Parmenides. So, I mean, he says that he speaks, he says, a mu kai su, as Aristotle and as Aristotle metaphysics lambda. And this is also Aristotelian in a way. So he thinks that, well, in the Parmenides, because there are there is, I mean, in the, in the you remember, I mean, in the eighth hypothesis, Parmenides speaks of Kito, uh, Ekeino, and these are the part, these are the masses that we are. So it's it's interesting. <laughs> I, I I'm not saying that it is true, but it is interesting. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Taran Harold. Oops. Okay, so, sorry, it just occurred to me that I, I I really wanted to say at this stage that what impresses me about Damascius's interpretation uh, of the is the ability to see something important in Plato's language. Um, and in particular, I think the eighth hypothesis, is is very um is is you, you know it's a unique <laughs> hypothesis in so far as it talks about things like skiagraphia and phantasmata and even onkoi that it it that suggests strongly that plato himself meant something about it and I, I, I see in um, in in Damascius's interpretation of it the sort of recognition that Plato is actually wanting to get something across at that point. <laughs> I, I I think so as well. Yes. Thank you. Does Carlos think so? I mean, do, do you do you do you agree with that? That the, uh, I mean, I, I I'm in I'm in sympathy with what Harold is saying, but I liked what you said about uh, the sharp distinction in Proclus that keeps us from going down this rabbit's hole. So, what do you say about the eighth or what I would call the seventh hypothesis in terms of uh, Harold's question? No, no uh, it's um, I, I will use the phrase of uh, Pantelis. It's it's interesting. I mean, to talk about the principles of um, of individuals, and to say yes, we have some Aristotelian um, a discussion of Aristotelian topics as potentiality in the real, concrete, sensible world, uh, the world of that that you know that's to to try that he tries to find principles even on that level. But my my criticism is that okay you can do that but now you are dis, dis, destroying the structure of the argument in the Parmenides that's but that's in itself as if you read it as a section on although it's a very obscure text about the the principles of the ethne what what's that racist principles or whatever all the all those elements that are mentioned there all kinds of principles of individual things. Yeah, it's it's uh, interesting to see that he tries to do that, but how it functions in the whole, that's, that remains for me a bit too. Yeah, but but Harold, you're not you're you're not claiming that the seventh hypothesis is interesting because it's about principles. You're saying <laughs> that it's interesting because it's pretty clear that Plato is actually talking about something that's not just. Just not that 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 has some connection to reality or the distortion of reality, and or but that that there's a thing there, right? You're not saying that it's necessarily interesting because of principles. Yeah, at least trying to get something across. I mean, if it were left to me, I'd be trying to relate it to the some of the the shadowy stuff going on in the Platonic receptacle in the time is yeah. right. <laughs> but yeah. I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to try and. Uh, Devise an interpretation, right? Here. I I just think it it it's to Damascius's credit that he 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 wants to give Plato some meaning here, where Plato's language does 
rather go off at a tangent. Well, thank you. Um, I also have a question about... Uh, Irini, there is also a question by Marcos Dendrinos. Which but... I haven't seen. Yes, because... I mean... It... Yes, he uh, raised his sorry, hand. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes. I'm always... Yes, I... Thank you. So, uh, yes, please. Uh, Pandelis, thank you very much for, for your presentation of uh, Damascus Thought uh, concerning Parmenides. Uh, uh, it, it was very delightful, delightful for me. Uh, I have a comment here. Uh, we see that uh, in Damascus' presentation, uh, it is uh, in Damascus' comments about Parmenides, uh, all the approach is uh, cosmological, theological, realistic, uh, uh, and uh, he does not uh, give attention mainly to the logical, dialectical nature of uh, the dialogue. Uh, it could be very interesting to uh, analyze all these hypotheses uh, without introducing any suggestions about uh, the elements, etc. And uh, I have seen that uh, there are many, uh, there are some uh, um, uh, trials uh, about it in some papers and books. Uh, I refer, for example, uh, the one by Graham Priest, uh, who uh, suggests that uh, all the work of Parmenides uh, is an attempt to introduce uh, a new type of logic. Yes, there are, I know. I'm aware. I mean, there are several. There are several interpretations, but this was considered. I mean, too too low in antiquity. Yes. So logic logic was was uh, for beginners, not for for real philosophers. Yes, I see. So this is why. So if you if you go with such an interpretation, then you are for those people you would. So Plato was not doing philosophy. So, but but they think that well. He is doing the most important philosophy in this particular dialogue. Yes, this is a, a great discussion about what yes. is philosophy. Yes, uh, but uh, uh, you know, in 19th and uh, 20th century, they tried it, uh, to uh, explain uh, most of the Platonic thought uh, in uh, logical and dialect dialectical terms. Uh, but uh, it is very interesting to see that uh, uh, if you give the uh, correct interpretations uh, in your approach, uh, none of these hypotheses uh, leads to contradictory results. There are also uh, some uh, visions of uh, uh, such an approach. Right, right. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Dendrinos. I'm sorry for Okay. Not, uh, seeing you from from the beginning. Uh, so now, if there are more questions, I shouldn't I shouldn't miss them. So please. No. So perhaps I can ask a question. Oh no, there is one. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, Leonid Lavandi. Yes. yes, please, Leonid. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was very interesting. Uh, I'd just like to ask for a clarification. Uh, you've touched upon this, but it's not entirely clear to me what uh, exactly uh, the phenomenal others of the eighth hypothesis are. So uh, these uh, uh, individuals uh, that come to be and perish perpetually. Uh, so could you perhaps uh, elaborate uh, a bit on that? Thank you. It's it's uh, it's uh, the phenomenal others are things like you and me. So so the the extended forms of the common of the mat, of the matter form compounds, but I mean the point is that well I, what Damascus means to say is that well you shouldn't take the that we shouldn't you shouldn't think that Plato in this hypothesis has in mind the actually existing things like you and me but our fathers and our forefathers and so on. So all individual uh, beings that exist from eternity, not only human beings, but everything. And this is, a, and th this is his way for uh, explaining 
that there is such a principle as the individual, or to put it differently, that the individual can be an arche. Because, I mean, the problem, the thing is there, uh, which is something that uh, Aristotle also addresses in Metaphysics Lambda, is that, well, I am an arche for of my offspring, but I'm not an arche in an absolute way, because I'm also an offspring of my father and so on. So what kind of, of, of arche is this? So you, so he says there, Damascus says that, well, you shouldn't think of me and you, but of all individual beings of the sublunary world. And there, and if you look of all of them that are infinite, because the, 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 the generation and destruction, corruption are infinite, then you can understand that how, in what sense, the individuals may be archaic. So it is a, it is about satisfying this this premise that Parmenid, that the, that the Parmenides is about principles. So it would be a bit strange, for instance, for Proclus to for Proclus to say, "Well, I am an arche, or you are an arche." What this should mean? And it is interesting also that well, he thinks that well, there are regional characteristics within within the the different living beings. Okay, thank you. So the individuals, insofar as they are principles, that would be right. the answer more or less. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. More questions or comments, please? If not, then perhaps I can ask a question which is on on T6, Padeli. Uh, so if my understanding is correct, you think that here we also have a reference to the poem of Parmenides. Mm. And I have been wondering uh, to what extent uh, uh, different Neoplatonic philosophers combine the interpretation of the hypothesis uh, with the interpretation of Parmenides' poem. Yes, thank you. I think that this is actually a testimony, which is uh, important, and it's all start. I mean, it started with Plotinus, so it is uh, at least there. I mean, five one. When he makes the when he makes the history of uh, of this uh, of the true of the true doctrine about principles, so he 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 leaves out, of course, Aristotle. So the the problem starts that the the erroneous teaching about the principles starts with Aristotle, but the, but before Aristotle you have you have this in Plotinus this old tradition, and in this old tradition you have Parmenides, which has been misunderstood. That's his point. So Plotinus says that Parmenides' poem has been misunderstood. This is why Plato uses. Parmenides as a persona in his dialogue, in the namesake dialogue, so as to show what actually the, the real teaching of Parmenides was, and that Parmenides was aware of, uh, I mean, the main point is whether one believes or not in the existence of a transcendent absolute one. This is quite important. The idea there is that, well, Aristotle does not have such a one, so this is why he's wrong. Whereas Parmenides, although he speaks in his poem of the hand on, he does have such a concept, such an idea about the existence of a transcendent one. So you have this kind of putting, of interpreting the Parmenidian poem, the poem by Parmenides in light of uh, the dialogue Parmenides, and basically the very, sa the very same method or the very same scheme is functional also here in Proclus. So he he tries to clarify a point a point in the dialogue Parmenides by appealing to the method followed by the philosopher Parmenides in its poem. So he I think he refers there. I mean to he refers in this passage to the Aletheia and to to Voxa, which I think is quite interesting because I mean the, the this use of hen of uh, of n is uh, what made me think of it. 
So this was the purpose. So it, it, it seems that he had an idea and we know that, that, he, that he had a manuscript, that there was a manuscript of uh, Parmenides' poem in the school of Athens. And it was used by Proclus and it was used by Simplicius as well. So it seems that, that they were extremely interested in the philosopher Parmenides in order to understand better the dialogue Parmenides. And this is why, and this is, I think, uh, how and why they read uh, the poem. Thank you. So, so in, in T6, what makes you uh, think that the Parmenides refers to the philosopher rather than the dialogue? Is above all uh, tonalithon and tonsevdon, which it is the it is the the n that you have kaigar tuto n. Yes, but this could not be. Uh, uh, this I was mean, it, the dialogue. Yeah. I mean, when he, I mean Luna, for instance, in his comment, thinks that this is a reference, a back reference. But dex i post to enos ontos panta apogenak, but this. I think it doesn't really work it's because, I mean, the, in 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 um, the passage referred to by Luna, mm -hmm. Proclus just makes a statement, and it and it is in the fifth book. I don't really think that this could be a back reference to something that he said, and it, this does not this that does not explain the end that you have there, or you could have something like a retai or something like that. So yeah. I think this is a historical tense, which I mean, this the the N is the first, uh, uh, which make me uh, which made me think uh, that well uh, here uh, Proclus speaks about the philosopher Parmenides. So what was the purpose of Parmenides himself? And then you get the Aletheia and uh, and the Talefe and Tapseude. Which you, uh, you which, which you mentioned, and I think that this is this what actually what he describes there corresponds to the way they understood. I'm not saying that this is what Parmenides was doing, but this is the way in which Proclus understood the two parts of of uh, the poem. The poem. So, so, he would, so he would see the method used by Parmenides in the poem as, of course, as transferred, as having been transferred by Plato to the dialogue. And this is what would connect the two philosophers. And this is what would make Parmenides an important philosopher. Needless to say that for the Neoplatonists, Parmenides was a Pythagorean. So everyone, I mean, all... It all started with Pythagoras. I'm not. I do not know why you were speaking about Neoplatonism and things like that. So I think. Thank you. I think I understand, and I. 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 I think that I also agree. But I wonder whether we can take Toparmenidi as referring both, perhaps, to the philosopher and to the uh, persona in the dialogue. Uh, so. But then, yes, this is a possibility. I've thought about it. But then you should find a passage in the dialogue before, in the, in, the, in the part of the dialogue that precedes this comment, where Parmenides, Parmenides, the persona Parmenides, does state such a thing. And there isn't. There is, yes, but, but... There, is, there, is no, there is no passage where the persona Parmenides says, well, this is what I, I'm about to do. But could Proclus have, take, have taken him as having that purpose? And that would be Proclus' interpretation of the poem and of what the, the, the Platonic Parmenides does uh, as uh, being... Uh, and, but then, but then how, how, do you, uh, how do you explain the past tense, the N? Because both are in the past, and the poem, and Parmenides in the dialogue. I mean, no, he's he's he he's actually commenting on the dialogue, and if 
the and this is this scheme actually concerns the entire dial so yeah. the past the past tense shouldn't be there i mean you when you when he, he, this is this is what proclus thinks is happening in the dialogue so there you have you would have i mean in this sense you would you should have an st or something so this is what this is what concerns the entire dialogue but, but there you get you get a, a past tense which either refers to something previously said and there is no such a thing or what remains is to the philosopher Parmenides. So, I mean, there are indications, of course, this, there are not uh, proofs, uh, but it, it seems to me that uh, that this is what, what he, he actually says there. And uh, if this is true, this is a new testimony. So I, I a agree. A new testimony to, but, to, to, the, to, think, to the poem of Parmenides. I think that to the extent that he also uh, refers to the poem of, the Parmenides, of Parmenides, then uh, he has this uh, in, which is a past tense, but this does not exclude that in also uh, can refer to, to, to the dialogue he is commenting. But to the extent that he also refers to the poem, perhaps it is, it is a reference to, to, to both, uh, seen as agreeing, as uh, saying the same thing. Yes, I mean this. This is true for the interpretation. Yes, but I think that this reading is not supported by the past tense, the historical tense used there. This would be my counter argument. Although we agree, I mean that this was uh, that that uh, actually Proclus thought. Well, this was Parmenides Parmenides's method in the poem, and this is what Plato makes Parmenides do in the dialogue. So uh, William wants to. Yeah, thank you. Why? Uh, well, I'm I'm grateful to Irini for for pushing you on this because I noticed that as well, and and I, yeah, I I don't I don't buy that at all. Uh, I I you know we're dealing with people that don't even make a distinction between Plato and the Eleatic stranger. They don't make a distinction between Plato and the Athenian stranger. So for you to tell me on the basis of a to parmenido that this guy is making a distinction between the historical. I mean, we've all seen that ridiculous attempt to purge Aristotle with whole Socrates versus Socrates, that attempt to kind of show that it, it's pretty obvious that he doesn't make a very clear distinction between the Socrates of the dialogue and the historical Socrates. That's such a modern way of looking at things. And, 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 and to I, I see your your past tense thing, but 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 what what I would also say is I noted that your argument seemed to be based on the awareness that the Parmenidean poem has two parts that it's got an Aletheia and a Dogza. I, I don't see an awareness of this in Aristotle. I don't see an I don't I certainly don't see an awareness of it in Plotinus. That that that. You know, what, what, I'm 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 ignorant of the question that I will ask you. So I'll ask you as a question: Who is the first person we can actually point to that's aware that the poem has an Aletheia and a Doxa? Because you'll notice that I didn't. I you you sped through your um, handout so quickly I couldn't go back and look at the Greek. But I but I was pretty clear that that it was about falsehood, not about Doxa. In other words, that the reference you were using to suggest not just on the basis of the end, but on on the basis of the two parts of the poem are being true and false is that 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 it was predicated on an awareness of a two-part poem that i don't see a lot of people having an awareness of to say nothing of the fact that casertano and the moderns are trying to dismantle that distinction even as we speak to me it's a really basic distinction but i don't see it as being a big distinction for them and then i also disagree with what you said about plotinus uh in 5.1 that, that, that correct, correcting, let me see, correcting, Plotinus is correcting the historical Parmenides on the basis of the, really, on the basis of the Eleatic stranger and the sophist at 248, 249. And it's on the, it's not about the one exactly, it's on the word akineton, 
it's on because he he needs noose to be moving. And so we've got all this thing about on being Akhenaton that, you know, Parmenides and Alethea is hammering, hammering, hammering. And that's why Mr. Plotinus has to drag in B3 and introduce it into the scholarly world for the first time to try to show that no, actually, noose is not the like actually the Noeta are not Akhenaton. They're actually moving, which, by the way, is why I think B3 belongs in Dogza because uh, there's not any shred of evidence as to where it begins, because there's no shred of evidence in Plotinus that he's aware of the two parts of the poem. So so tell me, you're the expert. Who who can you point to me as being the first guy that truly knows that there is a clear alethic distinction between Alethea and Dogza in Parmenides? Well, n now I think this is... Proclus in this particular passage. Which okay, is, well, great. Good. Let, me, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me explain myself. That is, Good. it's true that, well, you have the Alephe and, Pseudé and the Pseudé, as Irini pointed out, but if you look at the end uh, of the passage that I quote there in, in T6, the, he mentions ton dokunton, hemin einaiduinaton. So there is this adokunta, which I think uh, somehow relates to um, to the doxa part of the poem. And the first who makes this distinction in a very clear way is Simplicius. Right. So Simplicius, when he quotes, he quotes a, a, a major part of the poem, and then he says, this is the Aletheia part, and then we have the doxa. And my idea... Because he's quoting BA, well, right? This, if this, I, I don't really think that this, that this is an invention of of Simplicius, as I was as I was yeah. saying, I think that this was that that the um, the Athenian Platonists were extremely interested in the poem, and if we have this distinction, if to put it in a different way, if Simplicius was aware of this distinction, then I think Proclus was aware too, and uh, this is how I would answer to to your question. And of course, it's not about distinguishing, for instance, Socrates in the dial the platonic dialogues and the historic the historical socrates as we nowadays do or as we do in in modernity but these are still different texts so what Pro proclus is doing is that well i have a text which is the poem of parmenides and i have a different text which is the dialogue parmenides by plato and i think this is what he says that these texts relate to each other and in order to understand them, we should use the one to understand the other and the other to understand the one. And this is what Plotinus also does in 5.1. In, in this is how they generally uh, worked when they were reading texts coming from different periods of history. You do not seem uh, convinced well, I mean, it reminded me of my first question in the sense that your analysis of Dema Dema I, 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 I found myself wondering whether the logical tissue that you were presenting was yours as a modern trained in logic uh, at Thessaloniki. Uh, I, was and how much to be faithful. I was trying to be faithful, I mean, to, to, to Damascus. But I certainly think that that's, that modern question applies with even greater force to you know the question of the historical Parmenides versus the, the versus Plato's Parmenides, since I don't see these guys having the historical sophistication nor the logical sophistication, because they're kind of they have other fish to fry. Uh, but I you know I I I I, uh, I mean Simplicius is our source for Parmenides B eight, isn't he? Do I have that wrong? Right, 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 right. Well, thank you. That I mean, it's a, that's a very interesting question, and uh, and uh, I was hoping somebody would ask it. Thanks, Irini. That was. Oh, so thank you very much. Um, I think that if there are no more questions or remarks, uh, it is time we uh, thank Padelis once more for this great talk and fascinating discussion, and you all for. Uh, being here and for the discussion. So thank you very much.
uh, let me also remind uh, our next uh, meeting, which will be on the 3rd of April. And this is going to be a guest talk in the sense that uh, the topic has nothing to do with Neoplatonic commentaries on Plato. Uh, it is on Hermeticism in Islam. So it's, it is different than uh, what one would expect um, in, in this term. So I, I, I hope to, to see you there. Padeli, thank you again. And thank you, Rini. Thank, thank you, you for all. attending and for the invitation and for the, the passionate discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So have a nice uh, evening and see you very soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Kali Anastasi. Kali Anastasi. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.